Good morning, Cross Ridge. Um, we invite you to stand with us as we sing and pray and rejoice before our God. passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and 3 has this to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Amen? Amen. Um, we will have uh, a
groups in the front here to pray with you if you would like someone to pray with. And um, yeah, we just invite you to do that too.
sing this with confidence and with truth that you are here. Father, we pray that as we submit our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, that you would speak through Andy and that you would speak through the power of your living word. Breathe life into dead bones and help us to rejoice in the truth that is your word. Um, God, we are so thankful that we can sing songs like this that are true, our deliverer, you are savior. In your presence, we find our strength. And God, we ask for strength this morning. Be with us as we now turn to your word. We thank you so much for your love and for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, before you have a seat, greet someone. Give them a high five. Give them an elbow nudge. Hello. Bonjour.
Thanks, man. <laughs> well, good morning. No? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Before we jump into God's Word today, just a, a quick bit of housekeeping. Lee always says housekeeping. We're not cleaning anything. Well, actually, we kind of are. Maybe that works. A little bit of housekeeping this morning. Just to let you know, over the last couple of years, in case you were like in a cave somewhere, uh, church has been weird for the last several years. Uh, there's been a lot of things going on. For a long time, we were shut down. And during that time, we acquired a whole bunch of tech that made me nearly lose my salvation every single week. Um, But it allowed us the opportunity to gather together remotely. It allowed us to reach people who were unable to attend since uh, we've been allowed to come back together. Um, And while that is awesome, we have come to a place now where it is time to shut the live stream down. And there's a couple of reasons. <laughs> Was there clapping? <laughs> I'm just hoping that's part of my tech team who are like, yes, we don't have to remember to push the button anymore. Um, we have been so grateful for this technology. We are going to continue streaming every week, but we are not going to make it available to just everybody. If you have a reason that is like, and there are lots of people have good reasons. I will tell you right now, like waking up and it's kind of cold and raining and you don't want to fight traffic. There's no traffic. Just come. Um, But there are lots of people. We do have people in our community who are dealing with health issues. They can't be here. We want to continue doing that. So we are going to make these things available. If there are days when we have like a crazy snow day, we'll open that thing back up. If we have a special event that we want to just make more widely available to everybody, we will make that available to you. But just so you know, over the next couple of weeks, it might not be next week because I will be away and we just kind of want to keep things just on the, you know what? I'm talking too much. Live stream's going away. You're welcome. <laughs> really, though, we value gathering together as a body, in person, face to face. This is how God intended it, so we want to do that together. Uh, if you do have a Bible with you, you can open it up to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. For those of you using the YouVersion Bible app, uh, you can open it up, click the More button down at the bottom, and then you can click on Events, which is somewhere in there as well. And then you can see, oh, there's Cross Ridge Church. You can click on that. You can follow along. That way, if you just have a Bible, paper Bible, jump in there. If you have a Bible app that's different than that one, find John chapter 18. Uh, and just a bit of a heads up for those of you who are note takers, like classic fill-in-the-blank note takers, this is not a Sunday for you. There are no points in this sermon As I said to the earlier crowd, I hope that there is a point to this sermon, that it will not be a total waste of time. But the truth is, it's never a waste of time to open God's Word together. Uh, And we are going to be looking at a lot of different passages of Scripture. Um, And one of the things that's amazing about God's Word is that it's different than every other book that's out there. It's actually alive and does something amazing. Uh, God says this about His Word in Isaiah 55, "...for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven..." And do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And one of the best things about preaching is that if you actually teach what the Bible says, which is what we set to do, set out to do every week, uh, it's actually God's job to do something with his word. It's not my job. It's not Lee's job. It's not Sam's job. Anybody else you see up here, it's not our job to come up here and try to affect change in your life. The truth is, even if we tried, we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, It's God's job. He's the only one who can do it through His Spirit, through His Word. He changes us. He shapes us. He draws us to Himself. So, in the process of going through all these passages, keep your pens out. Chances are that he has something to say to you today that has nothing to do with me. So John chapter 18, we're getting so close to the end of our study of the Gospel of John. We've been in this book since October 2021. That's a long way. Um, And there's some big stuff going down in these next few chapters here as we make our way to the cross. So John 18 verses 1 to 14. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men, his disciples, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. That servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Let's pray for a second here. God, I... sometimes it's hard to see you. Sometimes it's hard to understand in the words that we read. Sometimes it's hard to understand in the messages that we are uh, given in the rest of our day as we go out into the world. Um, we just pray that you would give us clarity today around who you are and what it is that you've done for us and the way that you love us, um, that we can see the real Jesus, not the one that we've just made up for ourselves. We just pray that in your name. Amen. Um, I recognize for many of you in this room, this is a very, very, very familiar passage. You know, we're getting close to Easter. This is always coming up. Um, but there are also lots of you who are very new to the Christian faith or are just kind of checking things out. Um, you're trying to figure out who this Jesus is that people are talking about. And we've been uh, studying the book of John on and off since October of 21, like I mentioned. So it's possible that some of you, or some of the things that we've discussed over the last couple of years have maybe since slipped your mind, or you just weren't around to hear what it is that we were talking about. So we're going to take a few minutes just to, to recap, and we'll do that by way of working our way for the first couple of verses here. So verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, that's how our passage starts out today. These words, that's in reference to Jesus' farewell discourse, right? He's in the upper room with the disciples. It's the Last Supper. He's giving his final instructions to his disciples, though he's not fully done teaching yet. They're celebrating the Passover feast together for the last time. This is that feast that God had commanded Israel to observe every year to celebrate his delivering them from slavery in Egypt. You saw the Prince of Egypt or you know, Ten Commandments. Exodus didn't really get into it. It was a terrible... Don't worry. Sorry, i got to stop talking about movies. Judas, also, who was one of the disciples at this point in time, in name really only, um, he was actually a crook. He was not a real follower of Jesus, though he was with them. You might remember back in chapter 12, Mary... Uh, came to Jesus and brought some really expensive ointment or perfume, and she anointed Jesus' feet in this lavish act of worship. And this is what Judas said in response. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And we know that eventually his heart would be hardened to the point that he would actually betray Jesus and sell him out. In chapter 13, verse 21, we read, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples ask who, and in verse 26, Jesus answers, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So he dipped the morsel and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, What are you, or sorry, what you are going to do, do quickly. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he, Judas, immediately went out, and it was night. So by the time we actually get to our passage, Judas has left the Passover celebration to go and betray Jesus. The disciples don't know where he's going. They're about to find out. And after their time in the upper room is done, or as our verse says, when Jesus had spoken these words, everything that we've read since chapter 13, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now, we know from the other Gospels that this is the Garden of Gethsemane. Geth, Gethsemane. Say that with me. Gethsemane. 
It's a little break. You know what? We're doing fine. This is one of those times when John's gospel differs from the other three, right? Just a little bit here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record what took place between the disciples entering the garden and then when the posse shows up to arrest Jesus. This is what Matthew says in his account. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And a little while later, it says, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? And then a little later, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found the disciples sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. The hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. You see, my betrayer is at hand. So in the darkness of night, in the anguish of that moment, Jesus, after praying to the Father, That this cup would pass from him, he looks up and sees Judas and this crowd approaching him with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Verse 2 of our passage says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So this, this garden, this garden of Gethsemane, was a place that Jesus went with his disciples on a regular basis, and Judas knew that he would be there. In verse 3, so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, if you're like me and grew up in church when you were, you know, since you were little, you've probably seen a dramatic retelling of this, right? Like good old church passion play. And on this side, the disciples and Jesus look kind of nervously over to this side when in walk two, like Roman guards with the leather strappy sandals, a little kid, and a couple of Pharisees with the turbans, right? Like, that's, that's kind of how it goes. That's not how it would have been, right? John describes a band of soldiers, a cohort, and the, and the words that he actually used to describe this group of people was for a specific quantity. So scholars actually have kind of figured out that a group this size, based on these words, would have been around 600, maybe even 1,000 people coming to arrest Jesus, 600 at least, marching toward a garden with torches, weapons, and lanterns, and Jesus looks up and says, hey guys, rise, let's be going, my betrayer is here. And this is the setting, right? This is the setting in which all this takes place. It's in a garden that Jesus hands himself over to the authorities to begin the proceedings that will ultimately end in his death. And the fact that it's happening in a garden shouldn't be lost on us either. It was in a garden thousands of years before this night that Adam brought sin into the world. It was in a garden that God told Satan that one day he would send someone to crush his head. It was in a garden that sin entered the world, and it's a garden that Jesus hands himself over to conquer the sin of the world. Now, you might wonder if we're reading into that just a little bit too much. I don't think we are. I don't think John just says random things. I think these things were put here intentionally. They were put there to remind us that this event that he's describing, it's been in the works since the very beginning, right? Like all of history has been leading up to what's about to happen. We can't lift these accounts out of the context of the entire scope of Scripture. Like if the fall hadn't happened, right? If if Genesis, if the account in the garden, if they hadn't sinned, We wouldn't be reading this today. We wouldn't be having this encounter. Everything changes. If Israel hadn't been delivered from Egypt, there wouldn't have been a Passover. There wouldn't have been an upper room celebration with the disciples. And yeah, this is John's specific account of what took place, a specific situation, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Those little bits of detail are actually there to remind us of the bigger picture context and to increase the the depth of awe and wonder in which we stand before God who organizes all of this stuff. Tom Wright said, you can no more read this story at one level only, a simple arrest and trial, than you can plant a garden in a coffee cup. 
The only way forward is to allow all the different ideas and levels, the clashes of meaning, the misunderstanding to echo around until they produce prayer, awe, silence, and love. Like There's a lot going on in just these first three verses. So let's keep going. There's more. Verse four, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, and we're going to stop right there. We're, I know we're only three and a half verses in. We're going, to, we're going to get through this whole passage, I promise. But Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, how does he know all that's going to happen to him? And once again, John, the purpose of his book is to point toward the divinity, the, the godness of Jesus. John's gospel opens this way, and we've read this a bunch of times. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it wasn't only John who thought this, right? Remember back in John chapter 10 when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. This is Jesus talking himself. The Jews then picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, it is not good, pardon me, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So John's claim, Jesus' own claim, the claim of Scripture, the claims of his followers throughout history is that Jesus is God. When he walked the earth, he was fully man and fully God. If you have a pen, get ready to write this down. Theologians call this, and you know this, you've all memorized it, it's the hypostatic union. That's going to change your life right there. There's a lot in that that we don't have time to really unpack this idea that Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time. But being God, Jesus was omniscient. He was all-knowing. He knew everything. And included in that all-knowing, that omniscience, is prescience, right? The ability to know what is going to happen. We saw that played out in Matthew's account of Jesus' time in the garden when he was praying to the Father, asking that if there was another way, he wouldn't have to do what he already knew he had to do. He's God. He's all-knowing. Let's keep moving. Verse 4, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, keep going, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Now, this is another time where John's gospel differs a little bit from the others. And just so you don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying they had different ideas as to what actually happened. Like, they weren't contradicting each other. The writers simply differed in focus. They were trying to communicate something different to their audience. Matthew was writing to the Jews with the intent of showing them that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Mark wrote to the Romans to show the action and the power that Jesus had to meet their needs. Luke wrote to the Greeks to show that Jesus had come for people from all walks of life. And John wrote to everybody to show them that Jesus was God in human flesh and that he had power and authority. Jump over to Mark's description of this with me here in chapter 14. Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. It's the same as ours. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him, to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And so they laid hands on him and seized him. And while the other gospels focus on specifically the betrayal of Judas, and don't get me wrong, John speaks to it too. I mean, both times that he mentions Judas in this chapter here, he calls him the betrayer. And this is the last time that Judas is even mentioned in this book. So this is the theme that they want, they want you to know. Judas was a betrayer. But John, more importantly, wants to draw our attention to the power and authority and sovereignty of the God-man. He's pointing out that however helpless Jesus might seem in the moment, he's actually in complete and total control. Yeah, Judas came to him and kissed him. That happened. And the soldiers actually needed him to do that, right? They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know what he looked like. Unless they'd had a firsthand encounter with him at some point, they wouldn't have known which of the 12 he was. What John wants us to see here, though, is that Judas, when he says about Judas here, who betrayed him, Judas was standing with them. Judas was standing with the soldiers and the officers. 
Judas, who at one point was numbered in the 12 disciples. Judas, who would have gone out with the other disciples and performed miracles and seen miracles performed in the name of Jesus. The same guy that would have spent hours under the direct and perfect teaching of God on earth, that Judas was now standing with those intent on killing Jesus. Now, before you get too judgy, let's just put ourselves in his shoes for a minute, okay? Judas wanted something. He wanted a military deliverer. Judas wanted a Jesus who would make him rich, right? Like he, we know he loved money. Wanted to be powerful, influential. He wanted somebody to make him somebody. And I think that Judas might have actually figured out just a little bit before the other disciples that this isn't actually what Jesus was going to do. That Jesus wasn't about power, wealth, and importance. I mean, Jesus did say to the whole group, whoever wanted to be greatest should humble himself and be the least, right? To be the servant of everyone else. For Judas, that wasn't going to cut it. I mean, he had just spent years of his life committed to this man, and in return, he was going to have to be a servant? He didn't believe, and he wanted Jesus to pay. Back in my youth pastoring days, a long time ago, a Bible college came through. They were on a traveling, they had a traveling team recruiting for the school, and one of their team got up in front of our youth, and one of the girls shared her testimonies about how she had grown up in a broken home and was really lonely, and nobody liked her, and everybody was mean to her at school. But then she got invited to youth group, and she met Jesus, and everything became perfect. People liked her. People were kind to her. People smiled. They loved her. They encouraged her. And that story resonated very deeply with a girl in my youth group. Same story broken home, lonely, outcast. And so she decided to follow Jesus, or at least that's what she thought she was doing. She was actually following her dreams, right? She was looking for Jesus to give her the things that she wanted, that she was desperate for. And, and Jesus wants to give those things to her, but in him, not in the way that she wanted them. And that wasn't the deal. The deal is, I follow you, Jesus, and you give me what I want, right? Love and acceptance from the people around me. And if you don't, or maybe if you can't, I don't want to have anything to do with you. It, it kind of makes sense, right? Like Judas loved money, power, influence. He saw Jesus as his ticket to that. And when he didn't get what he wanted, he sought it elsewhere. He went to the religious leaders and he offered to serve up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was going to pay for letting him down. And on the surface, that seems to be what happens here, right? The arrest of Jesus looks to be the result of Judas's vengeful, skillful, strategic ambush. But what very few of those present that night would have recognized is the fact that this was all happening under God's control. This was all his design, Jesus was sovereign and in control. And John highlights this by saying that Jesus initiates a conversation. He just comes right out and says to the soldiers, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And then what follows is awesome. Verse 6, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now you've probably guessed or probably already know that there's a little more to this than just Jesus saying, yeah, that's, that's me. The phrase translated here, I am he, is actually just two words in the Greek, right? And what are they? I am. Now, if you didn't know this, I am is the name that God gave himself to Moses through the burning, pardon me, the burning bush. It's the same name that Israel knew him by. It's a name that no one would put on themselves except Jesus. But he is God, so it's okay. But not for those present, right? This was blasphemy. Earlier, we read a passage where Jesus was threatened uh, with stoning just for saying, I and the Father are one. He didn't say, direct, like, I am God, which is what he's doing now. In Mark's account of what's to come, following our passage today, Jesus is being questioned by the high priest Caiaphas. Chapter 14, verse 61 says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Same words. 
And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment. Blasphemy. And the common response to blasphemy among God-fearing people was some form of lament, right? Some show of disapproval or disgust. And in the garden, when Jesus says, I am, it's possible that those present were taken aback and showed their disgust by falling down. I mean, that, maybe that could be what you want to say, but it could be something else. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Hebrews 11, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The universe, the whole universe was created by God's word. He spoke it. He breathed it into existence. His word has power. And as we've been studying all through the gospel of John, the word of God is Jesus. Jesus is God's word. His word has power. Jesus has power. So what also might have happened here is that when he said, I am, what I imagine to have been like this blue energy field, I watch too much TV, but this blue energy shock wave came out from him and knocked everyone down. And that's actually a pretty common response to what we see in the Bible regularly. I'm not the blue energy field, but the response that someone has when coming face to face with God himself. In Genesis 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. Ezekiel 1, like the appearance of the bow that is in the clouds on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. Ezekiel 3, so I arose and went out to the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there like the glory I had seen by the Cheever Canal, and I fell on my face. When Daniel encounters the glory of God, he collapses. When Peter, James, and John see the transfigured Jesus on the mountainside before their eyes, they fall on their faces. In the book of Acts, Paul falls to the ground when he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And in this moment in the garden, when Jesus says, I am... He is revealing his true nature to those present and showing his oneness with the Father, a display of holiness and power that no one could stand in the presence of. Now, would the religious folks still have been disgusted? Yes. Afraid? Of course. But able to stand in the presence of God? No. Nobody is. Who are you looking for, Jesus says? Because if it's God, you've found him. Verse 7, so he asked them again, once they've gotten back up, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Again, it's just I am, maybe a little softer this time. But So if you seek me, let these men go. And this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. So Jesus remains in complete and total control of the situation. He asked them again, why are you here? They tell him, and he doesn't protest He doesn't question why, he doesn't run away, he doesn't scream, attack! He just willingly hands himself over. And since they said said that they were looking specifically for Jesus, I mean, he asked them to ask him twice, not Jesus and his followers. And as though it's just a given, as though it was the idea of the mob themselves, Jesus instructs these guys to let his disciples go. Now, Rome and the chief priests and the Pharisees, right, they had sent not just a couple of guys. They had sent hundreds of soldiers and officers, and in part because they were concerned that Jesus' followers, of which there were many at this point in time, would revolt when he was arrested. They also almost surely were there to arrest the disciples too. But Jesus is still in control. He's the one he's being arrested, but he's the one giving orders. He says, let my people go. And for those of you that know this Bible, that might sound familiar to you, right? This time he didn't need to use 10 plagues for his people to be set free. Just at his very word, they let them go. And this, we're told, is to fulfill what he said back in the upper room, just the last chapter, when he says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that Scripture 
might be fulfilled. So the good shepherd was caring for and feeding and protecting his sheep. But we also can't forget that just a few verses earlier, Jesus also told his disciples that tough times were coming. We read this in chapter 16. Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home and you will leave me alone. So that time of protection of safety was coming to an end. Indeed, the hour has now come when they will be scattered and will leave Jesus alone. They will walk away. Some will run. Mark even mentions one guy that runs off naked. It's actually it's in there, Mark 14. You should look it up. But none of them thought that they would run. They were all in, right? They were ride or die, or they thought they were. Mark 14 says, Jesus said to them, All of you will fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter told him, good old Peter, even if everyone falls away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to him, today, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he kept insisting, if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And they all said the same thing. Peter, right? Everybody loves Peter. We all know a Peter too, right? This guy is just a little, just a little overzealous. He says, if I have to die with you, I will. And in our passage, I think he might think that this time has come. Verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut his right ear off. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Like This is where we get, a lot of times we spend a lot of time on this moment because we love Peter so much. He is the best, right? In this moment, and forgive me for some of you who won't understand this, this is like a Leroy Jenkins moment when he just launches in and attacks with a sword. Why does Peter have a sword? The disciples were instructed to go around with nothing. Why does he have a sword? Luke 22, this is Jesus talking. He said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, That is enough. Now, Jesus has been telling his disciples that tough times are coming, really tough. In the past, Jesus had sent them out with nothing, but in Luke 22, he's saying, it's about to get really rough, you need to be prepared. And with these words, the still missing the point disciples seem to think that Jesus is getting ready to launch his military career, right? They get all excited to stockpile weapons and get the show on the road, and they look around each other, and they're like, Peter, you have a sword? Yeah, Peter has a sword. Okay, James and John, they're the sons of thunder. They probably have a sword. So we got two swords. Two swords, God? Jesus, we have two swords. And Jesus says, that's good enough. For a revolt, right? A revolution, 12 guys with two swords between them against 600 men? Jesus was not telling them to buy swords. Don't read this passage and think Jesus is telling you to buy a sword. He was using hyperbole. Anyway, Peter has a sword, kind of. The word that's translated here, sword, is actually probably better translated like dagger or knife. So so we have Peter taking on Rome with a knife. And who does he go after? Not the guys with the clubs, right? Like, not the guys with the swords. He goes after the probably unarmed, underprepared servant of the high priest, and he cuts his ear off. Poor Malchus. What was Peter hoping to accomplish? Like, after all the sermons, right? After all the heart-to-heart conversations in the garden, he's still looking for the one who's going to put Israel back on top hoping that when he attacked, Jesus would throw up a fist. There will be a revolution, right? Like he's just in there with them. Instead, Jesus looks at him and says, put that away. Verse 11, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Now, we don't know exactly what was going through Peter's mind, but we do know what was going through Jesus' mind. 
it was time to drink the cup that the Father had given him, the cup that he had pleaded with the Father to let pass from him, yet not his will, but the will of the Father. Stop it. I have to do this. This is the way it's supposed to be. And guys, this isn't the first time he's had this exact conversation with Peter. Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Like, this is not the first time. Like, they've been told this a number of times. He'll be killed and on the third day to be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, to rebuke Jesus, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's the same in our passage. Put away your sword. Your heart might be in the right place, but your brain isn't. It's on top of the fact that the sword was never part of Jesus' plan. It was never part of his plan. I mean, in Luke's account, he actually heals Malchus's ear. Jesus says to Peter, I could ask the Father for 12 legions of angels to come and fight for me right now if I wanted. The sword was never part of the plan. Resistance of any kind wasn't part of the plan. Jesus prayed, if there is another way, and clearly there wasn't. And he willingly turned himself over to the soldiers and officials and made sure the disciples would live to see another day, even if that other day didn't really seem worth living when it came around. Verse 12, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So Jesus is taken into custody. The disciples scatter. For the moment, they feel like everything is lost. Rome and the Jews feel like everything is one, but omniscient, prescient Jesus knows that this is just the beginning of the greatest victory that the world will ever see. Now, it's kind of a weird little aside thing that they throw in here about this visit to Annas, but it seems like there's another layer of sneakiness going on here. They, they take him to Annas, who is the father-in-law of the high priest. They don't even take him to the high priest. They take him to his father-in-law, who was kind of like a Don Corleone, godfather type guy who had been the high priest in the past, still totally respected, I don't know if they were hoping to maybe get Jesus killed right then, but either way, they go and visit this guy, but he gets passed on to Caiaphas. We met Caiaphas back in chapter 11, and in verse 14 of our passage, it says that it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. And the truth is, it would be, it has been, it is expedient for one man to have died for the people, but just not in the way that he intended And as we read back in John 11, those weren't even his own words. It says this, He, Caiaphas, did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Caiaphas was prophesying that Jesus would die for the nation. But not just for the nation, for all who would believe. God spoke through the man who had said out loud to his buddies, let's kill this guy. Again, God showing his sovereignty. But Caiaphas, he missed it. Everyone in our passage, with the exception of Jesus, was missing the point. I titled this sermon, Who Are You Looking For? And even though Jesus directed that question to the soldiers... I think he could just as easily have been asking everyone there. I think he could just as easily have been asking all of us a couple of millennia later. Who are you looking for? The soldiers were looking for this evil, countercultural agitator. They were told to hunt him down. It wasn't personal for them. They didn't even know him, right? They needed a guy to go up to him and kiss him to know who he was. They didn't know what he was actually about. Is that you? Like, have you been told by society, by your teachers, coworkers, family, news outlets, media, entertainment, that Jesus is anti this, that Jesus is anti that, 
that he's full of hate, that he wants to ruin your life by oppressing your sexuality and giving you a list of things that you shouldn't do. Because that's not Jesus. That's an angry person's projection of him. Judas had been looking for someone to meet all of his desires, all of his felt needs, right? To make him rich and important. He was one of the disciples, though. He was the one who had spent years with Jesus close. He saw the miracles, but Jesus didn't give him what he wanted. Is that you? Are you bitter because you feel that Jesus is withholding something from you that you deserve? That you've put your time in at church, you've read your Bible, and you've abstained from all kinds of fun stuff so that he'll give you that raise, so that he'll make that relationship work, he'll give you that peaceful, easy feeling? Because that's not him. Peter had been looking for someone to prove that he was right. That he, that Israel was better than other people, than other nations. That he didn't have to feel lesser than because his ideals didn't line up with society and culture. Is that you? Do you feel the need to rush into arguments and bash those who disagree with you? I'm not talking about respectful dialogue, right? Two people speaking to you. I'm not I'm talking about one person just shouting into the night. Are you raging against the world? Caiaphas, he was looking to get rid of Jesus so that he could just keep doing what he wanted to do. Is that you? Have you been pushing Jesus away because you don't like the way that he makes you feel? The way that he disrupts your way of life? Look, he does want to disrupt your life. He does. He does. Because your life is taking you somewhere you actually don't want to go. He wants to disrupt your life, not to ruin it. He wants to give you a life worth living. That's who he is. A.W. Tozer said, and it's a quote we hear a lot around here, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Because when we have that wrong, we end up bitter, angry, entitled, resentful, jealous, anxious, and aimless. We have to see Jesus for who he really is. We have to look for Jesus, the Jesus revealed in the pages of God's word, not the one that we've constructed for ourselves. In the coming weeks, we're going to be getting into the guts of the gospel, right? Like the messy, painful, ugly muck of sin and the wonder, the hope and the peace and the love of Jesus who died, not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad for us. So as we work through this together in these coming weeks, I just ask you, look for Jesus the real Jesus. Don't hold up your cut out of him in front of these pages. Look, look in the pages for him. And look, I recognize that like, something like this might just bring up more questions than it answers. And that typically is what happens every week. We don't try to answer all the questions in one go. We can't, right? We can't do that. The Bible is huge and it has so much to say. So we take it step by step, bit by bit. And as we make our way slowly through it, there might be something that you maybe can't wait to dig into. You need, you need to know now. Come talk to me. I would, I would be happy to chat with you. Grab one of our staff team, one of our elders, one of the prayer team that you kind of see down around here. Uh, if you came with someone, ask them. If they don't know, if these people don't know, they can pass you off to somebody who does and we can all work through this together because chances are we probably have some of those same questions too. Let's look for Jesus together because the more that we do, the more that we dig in, and find him together, the more surprised and in awe of and amazed we will be with who we find because he's amazing. So let's pray. God, we pray that your word and your spirit would reveal to us the truth about who you are and that we would not be looking for salvation, that we would not be looking for hope or peace anywhere else but in you. You've shown us so clearly who you are and we let so many things get in the way. We let our impressions be just confused. Oh. Yeah. God, we know that you came to give us life and we want that life. And so we pray you would show us how to get there following the real Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. Um, we are going to move into a time of communion together. Uh, as the band plays a song, I'm going to invite you to stand. You don't have to stand just yet. I'll get you up in a second here. But uh, this is something we do every week. 
to remind us of who Jesus is and what he has done. We come forward and we take a piece of bread that's representative of his body that was given for us. We take the the juice that's representing the blood that he gave for us. And what we'll do by way of just straight up instructions while they're playing, we invite you to come and take those things back to your seat. We'll take it together uh, after we've done singing. Um, But I also want to encourage you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this actually isn't for you. This is something that, that Christians do, people who follow Jesus. We come together and we do this week in and week out to remember. So if it's not you, don't worry about it. You don't have to come forward. There's no shame in that. Um, just encourage you to sing. Pay attention to what the words are saying in the song. Why don't you guys stand, and we'll do this together.
We read in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed, like we just read. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take this together.
Awesome. Well, before we go out in the good news of what we just say, <laughs> um, just a couple of quick things to let you know about. Just two announcements today, and both of them are about things that are happening tonight. Uh, first off, you might remember Daniel Golan. Uh, he was on staff with us for a number of years. He's been down at Christ City Church in Vancouver, one of our sister churches. Uh, he and his wife, Stephanie, are planting a church in Surrey this next year. Uh, and tonight they are having an info session uh, at, I wrote it down, Cafe Rose in, in Fraser Heights at 6 o'clock. You can find more information out or about that over at uh, ChristCityChurch.ca. Um, to find out more about how, like, we're going to be supporting them financially and how you can be praying for them. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that, you can head over there. Also happening tonight, also at 6 o'clock right here at the Clovo, we are showing the film Life Mark, which is a, a movie about adoption and about uh, just really the, the amazing thing that God has given us in this gift of a way of adopting people into his family and into our families. Um, it's going to be, uh, we're going to watch a film together, and then we're going to talk a little bit afterwards. There'll be some people here who are actually uh, adoptive parents here at Cross Ridge, uh, some of us who have gone through the foster care process as well. I uh, would love to chat about how uh, you can be involved in this awesome ministry that God has for his church uh, in meeting the needs of the fatherless. So I uh, encourage you in that. Let me read this passage of scripture, send you out. And uh, we'll go from here. We read this in Jude. Now to him who is able, this is Jesus again, right? To him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Awesome. We'll see you guys next time.